Okay, so to start off today, I actually want to do a little tiny bit of review back to when we were talking about covalent bonding. You guys remember back when we talked about covalent bonding, we talked about something called polarity. Ever remember talking about that? What's polarity? Okay. It is a molecule with a charged end. Just like we have the North Pole and we have the South Pole, they're opposite, right? Just like in a magnet, you have the North Pole and a South Pole and a magnet, they're oppositely charged. Molecules that are polar have oppositely charged ends. Now, we're not going to really have to go into the context, and you're not going to have to figure out if they're polar and do the math like we did in covalent bonding. I just wanted to refresh that piece of information because it's going to come into play right here. So when we're talking about solute dissolving into a solvent, okay, does every solute dissolve in every solvent? No. Is oil going to dissolve in water? No. All right. So we have to take into account whenever I'm trying to figure out if something's going to dissolve, I just keep telling myself like dissolves like. Okay. Things that are alike will dissolve in each other. Things that are different will not. Well, what makes things alike? Well, first of all, you have to think about the type of bonding. Ionically bonded things will dissolve in ionically bonded things. Covalently bonded things will dissolve in covalently bonded things. But that's not always the best indicator because sometimes covalently bonded things have charges, which so do ionically bonded things. So the better thing to look at is something called polarity. A polarity is when atoms have a charge. Ionically bonded atoms have a big charge. Covalently bonded polar atoms have a little charge. And so honestly, we're looking for charges. Okay, another thing that can make things dissolve is intermolecular forces. And this would be like hydrogen bonding, which really isn't a type of bond in itself. It's more like an attraction, kind of like magnets are attracted to the opposite end. But to refresh your memory on how you determine if a bond is polar, and again, like I said, I'm not going to make you do the math, but I talked about this a little bit last week. You are going to have to learn how to look at the periodic table and maybe determine some of these things. So if we're looking at the periodic table, if you think back to electronegativity, does anybody remember the definition of electronegativity? The ability of an atom to attract an electron. The stronger your electronegativity, the easier you can steal an electron, right? So if we're looking at the difference between francium and fluorine, is fluorine going to steal francium's electron? Yes. yes. Fluorine has a strength of 4. Francium has a strength of 0.7. They're not going to be sharing that electron. Fluorine's going to steal it. Okay, so this is going to be not a polar. This is going to be an ionic bond. The charge is completely transferring from francium to fluorine. But the other day, we actually talked about hydrogen versus chlorine, which isn't quite so obvious, is it? Okay, if you look at the difference between hydrogen and chlorine, 2.1 versus 3. So somebody is stronger here, right? Who's stronger? Chlorine, which means he is in control of the electrons more of the time. So if this is a game of tug of war, who's winning? Chlorine. So is this going to make a polar molecule? Yes. If there is a difference, which means they're far apart on the periodic table, they're most likely going to be polar. If we're comparing oxygen and fluorine, what do you think? 3.5 versus 4. A little bit polar, but not quite as much, right? Because that's much closer in strength. Is anyone actually going to win? Probably not. Fluorine might have a little bit of an edge up, but probably not winning. And so honestly, all I want you to do in this unit is I'm not going to make you do the math. Just look at the periodic table. If they're close together, it's probably going to be nonpolar. If they're farther apart, then it's probably going to be Here's the range, if you really want to know. 0 to 0 0.4 is nonpolar. 0.4 to 1.7 is polar. And if you get bigger than 1.7, it's ionic. All right, so here's what I'm talking about. Here we have a molecule. If we look at this molecule, what about this end? Does this end, is this end polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar. Why is this end nonpolar? Because there is, it's, first of all, it's covalent, so we have to look at the difference in electronegativity. So if we look up at the periodic table, let's look about, about how far apart carbon and hydrogen are. Are they far apart? 
Not really. They're not too far apart in the periodic table, especially when you take into account hydrogen technically belongs over there with the nonmetals, right? So if, and if I actually look at the values, hydrogen is 2.1, carbon is 2.5. So is that a very big difference? No. So if there's a game of tug of war going on here, nobody's winning, right? So this end of our molecule is going to be nonpolar. But let's look over here at this end. Oxygen and hydrogen are a little bit of a different story. They're a little bit farther apart, correct? Okay, now oxygen is not going to be necessarily stealing hydrogen's electrons, but he's definitely going to be in control of them. So that is where we get these slightly positive and these slightly negative ends. Why is this important? We already talked about this. In this Why are we talking about polarity again? Well, if atoms are polar, it affects if they can dissolve in solutions or not. Is this guy going to dissolve in water? What do you think? Water is polar. What do you think? Yes. This end is polar. So if we put it in polar water, is it going to dissolve? Yes. What about this end over here? Is that going to dissolve in water very well? No. So this guy is actually very unique. He can dissolve in water, but at the same time, he doesn't dissolve in water. And this is actually how soaps work. Do soaps dissolve in water? Not exactly, but they make other things dissolve in water, don't they? Okay, so it can kind of do one of two ways. And we're actually going to talk about soaps here in just a minute. All right, here is what it looks like when it is dissolving in water. If we look over here on the right, we see our water molecule. It's attract, this end is negatively charged, this end is positively charged. So it allows it kind of to stick together. Okay, and that's how it can dissolve in water. This end over here won't dissolve in water, so it kind of will stick out. So it's like a molecule that can half dissolve, half not dissolve. Okay, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because it leads into these terms. Now, last week when you had to make your water bottles, remember us doing the water bottle circuit? A lot of you said, well, can I bring in oil and water as a suspension? And my response was, well, oil and water is not exactly a suspension. Because remember, if you remember the difference between a suspension is, or the definition of a suspension is, the uh, solute particles are so big you can see them. Can you see the solute particles of oil? No. So it's not exactly a suspension. Is, a, is oil, does it have solute particles like a solution? Because remember, solution, you technically can't see them at all. No. So if I had to guesstimate what oil was, if it's a solution, a colloid, or a suspension, what would you guess it to be? A colloid. Why would we su suggest it to be a colloid? It's, you can, it all looks the same, but at the same time you can see that it's reflecting light, which is why a lot of oils seem to have like a color to them. Okay? And it's also, they're a little cloudy, it's hard to see right through them. Okay, so if we're actually trying to make oil something, I would classify it as a colloid, not a suspension. Okay? Now, when you put oil in water, what happens? It separates out, the oil goes to the top, the water goes to the bottom. Okay, so yes, kind of acts like a suspension, except colloid or and oil doesn't have really, really, really big or sol uh, solute particles. So it actually is something called an emulsion. An emulsion is when you have colloidal sized droplets of one liquid suspended on top of another liquid. So they actually have the same size solute particles. The reason that they're not dissolving has nothing to do with the size of the particle. It has to do with the fact that one is polar and one is nonpolar. Water is polar, so what do you think oil is? Nonpolar. And since they are not alike, they are not going to mix with one another, so they will separate. Oil will go to the top, water will float to the bottom. And okay. okay, when we're talking about liquids dissolving in one another, it brings us to two new terms. Miscible means that the liquids will dissolve in one another. So if I take vinegar and dissolve it in water, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to dissolve. What does that tell us about vinegar? Water is polar. If vinegar dissolves in it, vinegar must also be polar. Okay? Immiscible is when we're dealing with liquids that are insoluble, in other words, meaning they will not dissolve. So our oil and our water is immiscible, right? Okay. So this is basically what is happening. When I mix my oil and my water together, we can see the oil at the bottom of the beaker. We have some attraction going on. We have a 
We have our positive end of our hydrogen being attracted to our negative end of our oxygen. And the same thing's happening between this one and this one, and that one and that one, and this hydrogen and that oxygen, and that oxygen and that hydrogen. You see it's just like a constant, they're arranging themselves negative to positive, negative to positive. Okay? Well, our oil up here doesn't have any negative and positives. So it's, if it tries to find its place down here in the water, it'd be like you trying to put two North Pole magnets together. They're going to push each other away, right? And so the same thing's happening here. One is polar, one is not, so they're pushing each other away, and they're actually trying to get as far away from each other as humanly possible. All right, so do you remember that compound I was just talking to you about, the one that had the polar end and the nonpolar end, and I said it made really good soaps? Well, this is actually something called a surfactant. Okay, surfactants usually have a polar end and a nonpolar end, and they actually will reduce the surface tension between two things that are not alike. So oil and water, they are going to reduce the surface tension and allow one to dissolve into the other. So your mom cooks dinner. She's cooking hamburgers in the pan on the stove. After dinner, you're going to be a good child, and you're going to go clean up after her. Are you just going to put the pan in the sink and rinse water down it and it's going to clean it? No. What happens if you try to rinse grease down the drain? Nothing. The grease is going to stay in the pan. and Your pan is not going to come clean, right? Okay, why is that? Now that we know about polar and nonpolar, why is water not going to wash away the grease? Water is polar. Grease is nonpolar. They do not dissolve in one another. So that is why when you're trying to clean a glass that has tea in it, you could probably just rinse it out and it's going to be pretty clean, but that's because they dissolve in one another. Oil, grease are not the same thing, so we have to use soap. Okay, so honestly, what that soap is doing, I'll just show you in a second. This is a one second. Okay, soaps are, they actually... When you build them up and you look at them, they kind of look like tadpoles. And I like, well, you, I think you guys are talking about this in biology a little bit. I'm not sure you're in biology. But basically, soap is special because it has two ends. It has one end that is nonpolar and it has one end that is polar. So here is our nonpolar end and here is our polar end. Half of it likes water, half of it doesn't like water. So if when you're washing the pan for your mom, the grease right here is nonpolar. So all of the ends of your soap that are nonpolar are going to stick to the grease. They're going to band together because they don't like water. They're trying to get away from the water and they're going to form like a bubble. And then on the outside of the bubble are all of these polar parts of the soap that like the water. And so honestly how soap works is they take all of the nonpolar stuff that doesn't like water and they surround it and the outside is polar and that allows it to dissolve in water even though it's technically invisible. So, we're going to switch gears just a little bit now, and we're going to start talking about something called molarity. So yesterday in the lab, we made our super saturated solution, right? Okay, well, we can't just say something super saturated. We actually need to be a little bit more descriptive. If I tell you to go make sweet tea, and I will tell you to go, I want really, really, really sweet tea, the next question is probably going to be, well, how much sugar do you want me to add, right? Okay, that's the concept of molarity. Molarity is how much solute do you want and how much solvent. So basically all you're going to do is it's a little math problem. We're going to take our moles of our solute and we're going to divide it by the liter of our solution. Now, the symbol for molarity is a capital M, not a lowercase m. Why can't we use a lowercase m? Lowercase m is mass or meters, right? And so that's not going to work. Capital M is standing for molarity. So what we're going to do is we are just going to take our moles divided by our liters. You think I'm always going to give you moles? No. You think I'm always going to give you liters? No. So sometimes we're going to have to do little conversions. Sometimes we're going to have to convert into moles. Sometimes we're going to have to convert into liters, but we're not doing stoichiometry. Just a little bit of conversion. For those of you who like 
the T charts, um, physical science, molarity, moles, point. Those of you who like the T charts. Okay, this leads us to something called a standard solution. So you're at the store and you go and you like those Kool-Aid squirt. Sometimes they make them in Gatorade, sometimes they make them in Crystal Light, the Mio. You take the, it's a super saturated solution, honestly, and you squirt it into your water bottle. So technically you're making a saturated solution unsaturated, correct? That's what you're doing when you're making those solutions right there. Well, on the bottle, there's directions, right? It tells you to add two squirts per one water bottle. That's a standard. Is that how you necessarily like it? Yeah. No, but that's kind of like a standard. If we're trying to make it how the product is meant to be, you're going to make a standard solution. Okay, in that bottle, that's called concentrated, right? It's concentrated because it has a lot of salute in a very little bit. Same thing with laundry detergent. Now it's a big thing to sell the laundry detergent concentrated, which means you use less of it because it hasn't been diluted with water yet, okay? Which kind of makes sense because don't you put water in your washing machine? Yeah. You don't really need to dilute it ahead of time. You're going to dilute it when you add water to it. Okay, so we are making a standard solution. Do you think I can just go over to my scale, put some sodium chloride on the scale, get my number in moles? No. So when we are making a standard solution, we actually have to do a little bit of a process. So these are actually called volumetric flasks. And if you look at them, there is a line right here. Because of human error, when we read the graduated cylinders, sometimes if we need 100 milliliters, it's not quite 100 milliliters. And so these are honestly taking out the guesswork, and that line is perfectly 1 liter or perfectly 500 milliliters or however big or however much volume you're wanting. And that way it takes out the human error of messing up as you're adding water to it. So basically what you're going to do, we go over, we get our chemical, whatever we're trying to make a solution of. Okay, we're going to get weigh it out. So let's say we're doing hydrochloric acid. I'm going to go get some out in powder form. I'm going to add it to the bottom of my beaker. I'm going to figure out how many grams I need. And then I just add water until I fill it to the line. Okay, making a standard solution is really easy as long as you can do a mole conversion. Okay. All right, you guys ready for a practice problem? Okay. So this is the part I wanted everybody to get a piece of paper out so you could work through this problem with me. Now remember, molarity is equal to our moles divided by our liters. So it's a three variable problem, right? Easy, right? This is back in seventh grade math. Three variable. Okay, so the problem says you have a 3.5 liters of solution that contains 90 grams of sodium chloride. What is the molarity of the solution? Well, what is this piece of information? That's my liters, right? So I have 3.50 liters. That's one of my pieces of the puzzle, right? My other information given to me is 90 grams. Is that anywhere in my equation? No. I need moles, right? I have grams. I need moles. What can I do? I need to convert. So first step in any conversion is to... Write down what you're given. So we're going to convert 90 grams into what? Moles. So we're going to need a mole conversion. First of all, we are not doing stoichiometry here. We are just doing mole conversions. Okay, how do we go from mass to moles or moles to mass? What conversion factor do I use? Someone said it. Molar mass. Okay, remember, when you're doing conversion factors, you put what you want over what you have. So I'm going to use my periodic table and I'm going to look up what the mass of sodium chloride is. Sodium is 22.99 chlorine is 35.45 which is going to equal 58.44 grams. One mole of sodium chloride is going to equal 58.44 grams. So if I go in the lab and I take some salt and I pour it into a beaker, I need 58.44 grams to get my one mole, right? Okay. So now I'm ready for my math. My grams cancel out, I'm left with moles, which is my missing piece of my puzzle. 
So if I do 90 divided by 58.44, I get an answer of 1.54 moles. My significant figures match? Yes. 90.0 has 3. 1.54 has 3. All right, so I'm ready to move on. Now I just get to plug it into the equation, right? Am I doing any more conversions? No. no. I'm in liters. I'm in moles. Now all I have to do is solve for molarity. So do a little erasing so that I have some room. Alright, so to solve for my molarity, I'm going to take my moles divided by my volume, and I'm going to get an answer of 0.44 moles per liter, or we can just put a capital N. Either one is fine with me. If you just want to leave it as moles per liter, that's fine. If you want to use a capital M, that's fine. But this is how we read it. This is a 0.44 molar solution of sodium chloride. Now, if you're trying to guesstimate strength, I like to, in my mind, I always kind of think of one as being average. If you have a one molar solution of something, you have average. So is this going to be a very strong salt water solution? No. Okay, because it's less than one. What if I told you it was a six molar solution? What do you think? Very strong. Okay, so that's not always true, but in my mind, that's how I kind of remember. One molar solution is kind of like average. All right, so we are going to do one more example. Okay, this one says you have 0.8 liters of a 0.5 molar hydrochloric acid solution. How many moles of HCl does the solution contain? So again, our equation is molarity equals our moles divided by our liters. So I have to do any converting on this one? No. I have molarity, I have liters, and it's asking for moles. I'm given all of the units that I need. So I don't have to do any conversion. I'm just going to plug it into the equation, right? So 0 0.5 molarity equals moles over my 0 0.8 liters. And then you just have to do a little bit of algebra to solve. Now, what are we going to do to get our moles all by itself? I got to get the 0.8 out of the denominator, so I times it by 0.8 over here, times it by 0.8 over here. Okay, what is this going to do to our units? What is the L and the M going to do to our units? Because isn't molarity moles divided by liters? So what's going to happen to our liters? They're going to cancel out. What are we going to be left with? Moles. Is that what we need to be left with? Yes. So just kind of a check to make sure you're doing it right. So if we do 0 0.8 times 0 0.5, we get 0 0.4 moles. So if we have this kind of a solution, we're going to have need 0.4 moles. Now can I go in the lab and convert and get my chemical and put it on the scale of 0.4 moles? No. If I was in the lab, I'd probably have to go ahead and convert that to grams, but the question is just asking for this. All right. So to make sure that we understand this before tomorrow, because tomorrow we're going to do one step further, there is some practice problems that I would like for you to do. There is only four of them. You have 15 minutes in class to do four problems. Should anybody have any homework? No. So you need to be working on this. You can do this on the same piece of paper. You can do it in your notebook, but before I forget to tell you, right now I am planning on a homework quiz on Friday, okay, which is two days from now. Okay, You'll be able to use anything in paper form, nothing on your computer. So if you're doing your homework, your homework quiz should be relatively easy, right?